Well, good morning and welcome back. I'm Joe Clark, the managing partner of the Financial Enhancement Group. So happy to have you along. This is number three in a series of videos and strategies as well as concepts that we're using to discuss tax planning. This one's entitled to how to read your return. Now, your first question may be, what in the world does the Financial Enhancement Group do with my tax return? Well, the answer is the same thing that I'm going to try to teach you to do on your own. Remember, if you're doing this on your own, that is your business. If you're looking for a fiduciary, that's our business at the Financial Enhancement Group. We look at the tax return for every single family that we take care of because in all fairness, as fiduciaries, we believe it's the only way to do the job. Now, keep in mind, if you're doing this on your own, you still have a fiduciary, but that's you. You're the one that has to make all of the decisions, all of the determinations, and, and come up with all of the strategies and concepts. I firmly believe there are two tax codes in the United States, one for the informed and one for the uninformed. We want to make sure that you're informed, even if right now you're choosing to do this on your own. So as a fiduciary, my team and myself are trained to look at four components, risk and volatility, fees and expenses, the tax plan, both today and tomorrow, that journey that we're on, as well as real return or inflation. You'll remember from last week, we talked about the stair step analogy of how our tax code is structured, where each dollar we make, we pay a little bit more in taxes. <clears throat> as we go through this process, the more money we make, the higher we go. The average that we pay is called of our effective rate. That's the average tax we pay on the average dollar we earn. But our last dollar, and that's what's essential in tax planning, the last dollar is what we call our marginal tax rate. It's where are we at the very tip top. That last dollar is exposed to how much impact from the Internal Revenue Service that year. So how do you read your return? Well, most people understand, I believe, a concept in these three little letters called adjusted gross income. That's what you made last year. Now, made is a wide open topic. Um, I, I believe when I talk to people that were retiring in the 50s and 60s, they believe that they didn't make any more money. Um, that's inaccurate. You, you have W-2 income while you're part of the workforce. That's when an employer is paying you or self-employment income if you own a business and you're working for yourself. But there's also interest, dividends, capital gains, rental income, farm income, all of that, whether it's something that you actively did or passively got, all of that income comes together and goes into this thing called adjusted gross income. Now, accountants like to add up a lot of things that, quite frankly, I wonder why. But AGI is one of those. It really doesn't tell us a lot of things. However, the tax code has some rules that are directly attached to whatever this number may be. To make matters confusing, every now and then you'll see a thing called MAGI. And when we talk about Roths in a few weeks, you'll know that the Roth contribution levels are based on your modified adjustment gross income. That number you're going to find on your tax return on line 12. What is your taxable income? Actually, it may be 11. You know, they monkeyed with all of these returns that are, that are out there anymore. Um, yeah, it is line 11. And it will tell you what your adjusted gross income is uh, in terms of what you made. You know, I got into this industry two weeks before the crash in 1987. <laughs> Tax returns didn't change much at all. The forms that we actually used did not change. Just a little bit of movement. But for years and years, they were consistent. And then all of a sudden, we had this tax change effective January 1 of 18, uh, and the whole document began to change. But this is going to be found on line 11. There are some rules that come with it that you need to know about if you're doing your tax planning on your own. The next line, line 12, is going to tell you whether you take a standard, standard deduction or whether you're going to itemize. Now, we're going to come back to that because that's the essence of really this video, and it is a key thing that you will need to understand in some of the strategies that we're going to put out coming afterwards. Eventually, you're going to get to line 15. Line 15 is going to tell you your taxable income. And once you know that number, 
once you know what your taxable income is, then you can go back to the stair-step concept. So what this is telling you, it's not your first dollar that goes on the staircase. That first dollar that's earned up here goes down into your adjusted gross income on line 11, is reduced either by your standard or itemized deduction that you find on line 12, 12A, and then there's charitable, and et cetera. And then line 15 is once your deductions are taken away, how much taxable income do you have? This is the big cojona. Right? This is the one you've really got to pay attention to. It tells you how these stair steps are going to work and really drives what that marginal rate is. For instance, if you're over 65 in central Indiana, um, if I can keep your income below about $108,000, 106 dollars to $108,000 of taxable income, right? that means you can have about one hundred and eight dollars to $110,000 of AGI, and you pull out the standard deductions, suddenly you're going to be down to a taxable income that will get you at the top of this 12% bracket. We're able to do that for an awful lot of families, and that is an ideal spot. It's probably the sweet spot of the U.S. tax code. But for right now, let's talk about standard or itemized. The standard deduction is a deduction that the Internal Revenue Service offers to everyone. It's free. Uh, the reports are now 90% of people take the standard deduction. So there's only 10% of us that really itemize. So the itemized schedule, if you will, there are, are a series of things that you can itemize or deduct from your taxable, deduct from your adjusted gross income to arrive at your taxable income. The big three, by the way, have always been and probably always will be what you pay to the state you live in, that is capped, by the way, under what's called the SALT tax at $10,000 for state and local tax. So that's where your property tax goes, what you pay the state of Indiana if you happen to be a good Hoosier. Um, it's your state tax. It's your mortgage interest. Many of you already have your homes paid for. And then the third is your charitable gifts. So there's some things you can control and some things you can't. Um, you can prepay state taxes. So if you want to pay next year, and you may think that's crazy, we'll talk about that in the bracket bumping strategy later, uh, or in the, in the double stack, rather, uh, in another video. Um, but you can prepay some of those taxes. The mortgage interest, if you're still paying the bank, you really can't get ahead of and pay. That one you're kind of stuck with. Charitable gifts you can control when a charity gets the money, and it really depends on the charity. Uh, there are some places that Barb and I donate to that spent the check that they're about to get before they even received it. There's others that have an ample amount of money that is already put aside, and they can do some really good timing, allowing you to do some really strong, solid tax planning. So you have your choice. You either get the freebie or you're able to itemize. If the itemizing of the state taxes limited to the $10,000 cap, mortgage interest, and your charitable gifts is greater than the standard deduction, so think about it, the state tax is limited to $10,000. Most of you don't have mortgage interest, and if you do, fortunately, our homes are rather reasonable. The mortgage interest usually isn't that high. So the only way that most people have more than the freebie is if their charitable gifting is really a high amount of money. And again, you can control when you make those charitable gifts. And we'll talk about that in the double stack concept. So this $27,000 is free or you can itemize. And this is something that most people never really think about. They gather and collect receipts all year long. They hand them to their CPAs at the end of the year. The CPAs title them up and tell you either you get the standard or you get the itemized deduction. And they'll come back. I, I saw a return last year where somebody had a $29,000 itemized deduction. And it was a married filing jointly, and you know they had twenty nine thousand dollars, and they said, fortunately, that twenty nine thousand dollars came off. Well, when I broke into it and started talking to them, and this is why we take our tax re your your tax return. It's why if you're your own fiduciary, you need to be doing it yourself. Twenty two thousand of this was charitable gifts. Seven thousand of it was what they paid the state and for property taxes, etc. So they didn't get, in my mind. And in all fairness, they didn't get a $29,000 itemized deduction. They got a $2,000 itemized deduction. It's actually a little bit less. And that's because the IRS gives you $27,000 plus if you're married, filing jointly. 
right? They give it to you. It's a freebie. If you made zero charitable gifts, you still got the $27,000. So even though they made a $22,000 gift to charity, they only got to take off of their tax return $2,000. Now, uh, this is not me ever telling you not to be charitably inclined. Uh, this is not saying you shouldn't have given the money. And there are those of you that are out there that are watching this going, Joe, I give because I'm generous and because I believe that that's what I'm called to do. Uh, and I get that. And I'm not trying to in any way, shape, or form tell you to give less. The Better Giver program, one of our programs at the Financial Enhancement Group, is about teaching how to people to be more effective, more efficient givers. Not bigger, not smaller, more effective, more efficient. And the way that we're able to do that is by understanding these rules inside of the tax code so that you can have your taxable income, your marginal income controlled that gives you the best options to initiate some of the strategies that we're going to talk about coming forward. Now, next week, we're going to talk about bracket bumping, and then we'll get into the double stack. But I really need to make sure you understand where we are along this code. Key things to keep in mind as we go. Two tax codes. It's not one for the rich and one for the poor. It's one for the informed and one for the uninformed. But if you don't take advantage of it, you might as well not have known, right? So what I want you to do, your task, what we call your next steps at the Financial Enhancement Group, what I would like for you to do is to go find last year's tax return. It's the best history, uh, history exam that I can give you to better tell a story for next year. Get out that thing, understand what's on line 11 and what went there. We're going to talk about income variability, and that's probably actually next week, by the way. We're going to talk about income variability, and you're going to look at last year's return up to line 11, and you're going to see if there's any income that you had last year that you don't normally have. Maybe you sold a rental. Maybe you sold a farm. Maybe you had a big bonus. You know, something of that nature that was taxable. It's not money that's coming in. That could have been an inheritance that doesn't even show up on a tax return. What we're talking about is what the IRS knew from last year, what income went on that return, right? It's, we're going to look for any differences because that could change everything. You're going to look on line 12A to see if you took the standard deduction or the itemized deduction. If you took the itemized, you're going to see what the total is. It will tell you, and you can understand how much of it was state tax, how much of it was mortgage interest, how much of it was charitable. You could have had some medical expenses in a really bad year, but again, that's limited by your AGI in terms of what you can deduct. A couple other things, and then you're going to understand taxable income so you can think about about the stair step. So as we proceed, you need to know what step, what your marginal rate is, what is your last dollar going to be taxed at. If you've missed the previous videos, don't forget to go to fegtaxpack.com. We'll be more than happy to get you back in the, in the order so that you can get caught up because it really is a building block. It really is a series of thoughts that need to go. Try in all cases not to take this single video and apply it to yourself. Or I'm always going to let, remind you that this is general information. It's no different than when I'm on the radio or my newspaper column. This is general information. Please work with a professional advisor. Your, your advisor at FEG, somebody who's trained in tax planning or a CPA you know, that's engaged in tax planning. And don't confuse the difference between tax planning that has to be done by the end of the year and tax reporting that is t it's told after the fact. It's telling the story to the IRS about what you did this year. Let's get ahead of it. Let's be proactive. Don't forget to join me next week for income variability and give us a call at 833-TAXPAC or go to fegtaxpack.com. Make sure you get caught up on the videos. I look forward to seeing you again next week.